their intention, their declared intention, whether they can actually pull it off without causing a recession or something worse remains to be seen. I'm, I'm doubtful. I think that this will actually be end up being a, a blunder on the Fed's part. But just to talk uh, about how they do it, Dave, because um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. So go back to 2008 to the financial crisis. The Fed's balance sheet at the time was about $800 billion dollars. Uh, and relative to their capital, it was, you know, a reasonable amount of leverage, uh, you know, not really that different from, uh, from a lot of other banks. As a result of their response to the crisis and QE1, QE2, QE3, all of which were money printing programs by the Fed, uh, led by Ben Bernanke, who was the chairman at the time, the Fed expanded the balance sheet to, uh, over 4.3 trillion dollars which means starting from an 800 billion dollar base they created three and a half trillion dollars of new money out of thin air that's how they operate and got the balance sheet up to about 4.3 trillion dollars now here's the problem they're facing um they're getting ready for the next recession they don't talk about this publicly but that's what they're doing and the, the other thing they did in addition to expanding the balance sheet is you know they cut interest rates to zero so all of a sudden here we are in let's say um Early 2013, when Bernanke was still chairman, interest rates are zero. The balance sheet's over $4 trillion, and that was all considered a, a response to the last crisis. But what are you going to do in the next crisis? What are you going to do if there was even a recession, a business cycle recession, let alone a financial panic? How could you cut interest rates when they're already zero? How can you expand the balance sheet when it's already you know, beyond belief, it's for over four trillion dollars, and you're in danger of, uh, you know, jeopardizing confidence in the U.S. dollar if you go any further. Well, the answer is you can't. You're not prepared for those eventualities, and so the Fed had to begin a program of what they call normalizing, getting interest rates uh, back to normal, which means raising them, and getting the balance sheet back to normal, which means reducing it. They started this in 2013 with the so-called taper where they were still printing money. They just printed a little bit less every month. Then they got to the end of the taper in November 2014, so they stopped printing money. But they kept the balance sheet where it was. So they didn't expand it. They didn't print new money, but they didn't reduce it either. And the way they did this is um, the way the Fed prints money, they just call up dealers and buy government securities. So it could be you know any of the primary dealers, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, whatever. And the Fed has a trading desk called the Open Market Desk. And they just call up Goldman Sachs and say, hey, you know, offer me some tenure notes. And Goldman makes them a price and they say, okay, done. And Goldman delivers the bonds and the Fed pays for it with money from thin air. The Fed just basically puts the money in Goldman Sachs' bank account at whatever bank and that money comes out of nowhere. So that's how they create money. Now, they can do the same thing in reverse, which is they can sell securities back to the market. The dealer pays them with money and that money disappears the same way it it was created. So that, that's how the monetary policy is normally conducted. So the Fed got to the point where, as I said, they had this four, over $4 trillion balance sheet. Now, when they said they want to normalize it or reduce it, a lot of people took that to mean, oh, well, gee, you're going to dump all these securities on the market. You're going to sell all these securities. It's going to sink the bond market, et cetera. And that's not true. That's not how they do it. The way they do it is if you hold a treasury note and it matures, the Treasury just sends you the money. You don't have to sell anything. So if I bought a five-year note five years ago and I still hold it today and it, it matures, the, the Treasury will just send me the money. I don't have to sell the Treasury note. And that was what the Fed plans to do. That is what the Fed plans to do, which is uh, up until this month, literally a couple of days ago, uh, October 1st, the Fed had been – uh, when they got money on the old bonds, when the old bond matured and the Treasury sent them the money, they went out and bought a new one. So they would re receive money, but then they would create money by buying new bonds, just enough to keep the balance sheet where it was. But what if you got the money on the old bonds and did not buy a new one, did not go out and roll it over? Well, then the balance sheet would be reduced, as I explained. And so that's what the Fed's starting to do, effective October 1st. So they are reducing their balance sheet as of now. Uh, they're doing it slowly. They said their intention was uh, $20 billion a month, uh, $10 billion of treasuries, $10 billion of uh, mortgage-backed securities that they would not roll over. Now, which means that they're still rolling over most of it. They're still printing money and buying bonds. They're just not buying as many as they used to, and the effect is to reduce the balance sheet as the old bonds run off. They're going to increase that amount, by the way. They're, they're, every quarter, they're going to increase it by another uh, $10 billion. 
until they get up to um, uh, 50 billion a month, which would be 600 billion dollars a year. So these are big numbers, but we're not there yet. They'll get to that level over the course of 2018. So it's a very passive kind of thing where they don't sell a single bond. They just wait for them to mature. They don't roll over all the money, and some of the money disappears, and money supply is reduced, and the balance sheet is reduced. So that's how they go about it. Now, here's where it falls down in terms of the macroeconomic impact. For some reason, the Fed wanted us to believe that quantitative easing was stimulative, that it helped the economy, but quantitative tightening, which is what we're talking about, isn't going to hurt the economy. They they want us to believe it's asymmetric, that printing money is good, but not printing money is not bad. Um, that makes no sense. That's, that's ridiculous. Uh, of course, this is when you reduce the money supply and, and you take away a bid, uh, in the bond market, of course, that's a tightening of financial conditions. The Fed just wants you to uh, to pretend otherwise. So, this is the program they started. They they want to get the balance sheet down to around you know some number about two two and a half trillion. I realize that's still a big number, but it would be down significantly from the four and a half trillion. And the other thing they're trying to do is get interest rates up to about three three and a quarter percent. That's what these recent rate hikes have, have all been about. So. And say, why is the Fed doing this? Well, they want to, they know from history, there's good reason to believe that, uh, if the U.S. economy is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates 300 basis points or three full percentage points to get the U.S. out of a recession. Maybe more than that. Maybe even as much as, uh, four percentage points. Well, how do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 100 basis points to begin with? Well, you can't. You can't do it. You can only get back down to zero. So, what the Fed is trying to do is, in addition to uh, raising rates, th- their fear is that we'll hit the recession before they get rates up to three percent, and that they'll be the recession will start when rates are you know one and a half, maybe two percent, and they'll cut them all the way back down to zero. But then they'll be stuck again. They will not have cut them enough to get out of the recession, but they can't cut them anymore because they're at zero. Well, then what do you do? Well, go to QE4. Then you go back to money printing, basically replay the whole Bernanke playbook from 2008 to 2013. Well, the problem there is how do you do more QE if you haven't normalized the balance sheet without destroying confidence in the dollar? The answer is you can't. So so reducing the balance sheet and increasing rates are basically you know, reloading uh, uh, the weapons, basically re- reloading the toolkit. They're, inc- they're raising rates so they can cut them, and they're reducing the balance sheet so they can expand it in the next recession. The problem is, the finesse is, how can you do that without causing a recession? How can you tighten monetary conditions in what is a very weak economy without causing a recession? You probably can't. I I don't think they're going to be able to pull this off. They think they can. They talk about it. They explain it to you. But um, in my view, we will, in fact, hit either a, a normal business cycle recession or a financial panic before the Fed gets back to normal, either in rates or balance sheet size. And then they're going to be out of bullets again, and then we'll go to QE4, um, but we'll be one step closer to really the uh, complete loss of confidence in the dollar. Now, I, I hear you saying all this, and but I'm also picturing Janet Yellen saying that we're not going to have a finan- another financial crisis in our lifetime. So on one side, you're saying that they're doing this preparing for a recession, and she's out there saying that, yeah, we're not going to have anything coming or you know anything bad is going to be happening anytime soon. Well, first of all, let's um, separate business cycle recessions from financial panics because they're two different things. Um, business cycle recessions, you know, come and go. We've had, I think, 14 business cycles since the end of World War II. Uh, they're pretty, you know, normal affairs. People, very few people can predict them. The Fed has never predicted a recession. M- most mainstream economists have never correctly predicted a recession. I'm not saying they're easy to forecast, but they, it is easy to say that they happen with some regularity. Because as I say, it's happened 14 times since the end of World War II. And all that happens is, um, you know, the economy grows and grows and unemployment goes down and then prices start to go up and the Fed's watches and all this, the prices go up some more and the Fed goes, oh, we better tighten. And then they tighten more. They're always late in the cycle and they tighten, they tighten and sooner, sooner or later, you know, by raising rates and then they over tighten. They cause the economy to slow down. Um, you know, housing market declines, unemployment goes up, uh, def- inflation goes down and the economy gets weaker. And then we're in a recession. And the Fed goes, oh, we better ease. And then they cut rates, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So all the Fed does, the Fed never leaves the economy. The Fed always follows the economy. They, they tighten in the late stages of, uh, an expansion and they cut in the late stages of, um, 
uh, there were, you know, an economic correction or recession. So that's a normal business cycle. A financial panic is different. A financial panic uh, seems to come out of nowhere. Uh, it's uh, some unexpected event, whether it was, you know, 2007, um, the, the collapse of a couple of Bear Stearns hedge funds or in 1998. Um, you know, the Russian default, and the collapse of long-term capital management, or in 1994, um, the Mexican uh, default, and the so-called tequila crisis, or in 1987, it was portfolio insurance and the interaction between the futures market and the cash market, and um, uh, 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 basically a lot of feedback loops, recursive functions between the two markets that took the markets down. So the crisis can come out of nowhere, uh, can be very unexpected. Now, sometimes they go together. In 2007, 2008, we had both. We had a, a recession and a panic. In 1998, we just had the panic. There was no, there was no recession in 1998. In fact, the stock market went on to hit all-time highs in 2000. Um, in 1987, there was no recession. We had the, the stock market fell 22 percent in one day, one day, but there was no recession. Uh, in 1989, we had a recession, but no panic. So sometimes they come separately. Sometimes they go together. But they're both on Janet Yellen's radar screen to, to come back to your question, Dave. So, so let's separate them. On the business cycle, the Fed has, has never predicted a recession, but they know they happen. So they're saying, well, we're not predicting one. We don't necessarily even expect one anytime soon, but we're getting ready for one because we know it's going to happen. And if we don't, you know, um, reload the gun or, uh, or, you know, replenish the, uh, the toolkit, uh, we'll be out of tools. Uh, we'll be out of weapons when the time comes. Um, as far as financial panic is concerned, uh, that's that's a kind of a complex dynamic phenomenon, or at least I think about it and analyze it using complexity theory um, and other disciplines, um, behavioral psychology and Bayes' theorem and other branches of applied mathematics and history um, and, and and other tools that, that are not the mainstream toolkit. They, they actually work extremely well. I've had very good results with them, but most economists are not looking at it that way. But um, financial panics uh, do seem to come out of nowhere, and you're always looking for signals. Now, when Janet Yellen said, we will not have another financial panic in our lifetimes, to me, that was the clearest signal that we were getting closer to a financial panic. Uh, it reminded me, my first thought was when Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of the UK, returned from meeting with Hitler and landed in uh, London and said, I, I have brought us peace uh, for our time, meaning there's not going to be a war. And of course, there was a war within months. So when the elites tell you one thing and that they're sure of it, you can be pretty sure the opposite is about to happen. So um, so both things are in play. We could have a business cycle recession sooner than later. In fact, I expect we will. And the Fed will not be prepared for it because they haven't been able to raise rates enough or reduce the balance sheet enough to dig us out of that hole. And then we're just going to be stuck in a continuation, really the second technical recession in the depression that began in 2007, a little bit of a replay of what happened in 1937 after the um, recession of 1929 to 1933, and just not going to be able to get out of it. Um, or we could have a financial panic any day. We're primed for one now. I'm not saying it's going to happen today or tomorrow, but um, no one should be surprised if it does. Uh, it certainly will happen um, sooner than later because they also come around with a, you know, kind of seven to ten year ten year time frame like clockwork. I mentioned eighty seven, ninety four, ninety eight, two thousand eight. I mean, you don't have to, you don't need a PhD to expect the next one any minute. Um, and again, the Fed is not going to be prepared for that. So, so what I expect is that uh, at a minimum we'll be heading for a recession based on a weak economy. At worst, we'll have a financial panic worse in 2008, but unlike the last several times, the Fed will not be able to deal with it because they never normalized from the last time. Now, I wanted to add on to that, everything that you just said, uh, and I wanted to touch upon the dollar and China and what they just did. They took the yuan, they priced it in crude oil, and they backed it by gold. And we see that, you know, Russia, we see Venezuela now made the announcement that they're going to be, you know, trading their oil in the yuan. Other countries most likely are going to join in with this. Uh, where does the dollar stand or the petrodollar stand as China does this? I mean, is this the end of the dollar? It's the end. It's the beginning of the end of the petrodollar. And in some ways, the demise of the dollar is the benchmark global reserve currency. So that's a very big deal. And I'll, I'll talk more specifically, Dave, about a couple of the developments you mentioned. But I do want to emphasize for the listener that um, 
these are, are big processes, but they play out over time. It's not like we all go to bed one night and then we wake up in the morning and there's no more dollar. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not how these things happen. They can uh, crescendo in financial panics at times, but they, they generally tend to play out over long periods of time. And my example is, um, how did the U.S. dollar replace pound sterling as the benchmark global reserve currency? How did that happen? Because you go back to 1910, 1911, the, the, the pound sterling was the global reserve currency, non-parel, hands down. It was the world currency. You could get on a steamer in London and go to, um, Bombay at the time or, um, you know, uh, uh, Burma or a- anywhere in the world. And, uh, that pound sterling uh, was, was money good. Uh, and yet by the end of World War II, by 1945, the dollar had displaced it and sterling was sort of in ruins. It's still around. I mean, there's sterling is still reported to the IMF as a reserve currency. It's just a very small position, not a very important one. Um, but how did that happen? Well, it actually happened over a 30 year period, beginning in 1914 and I was ending in 1944. Uh, 1914, of course, was the beginning of World War I, but recall that the U.S. was not in World War I at the time. Uh, the U.S. didn't join World War I until 1917. Technically, in 1914, we were still neutral, but the U.K., of course, was one of the combatants, and the U.K. needed everything. They needed food, they needed wool for uniforms, they needed weapons, ammunition, uh, and they got all that stuff from the United States, but in those days, under the gold standard, you had to pay for it with gold. Um, and so there was this large gold drain beginning in November 2000, uh, sorry, 1914 from London to the United States. Um, some of it was done via Canada. I mean, there were concerns about putting gold on vessels because of, uh, submarine warfare, but, uh, we got the gold is the bottom line. So that continued through the twenties and thirties. Um, in 1931, sterling devalued against gold. In 1933, the U.S. retaliated. We devalued the dollar against gold. In 1936, the U.K. devalued the sterling again against gold. They suspended gold exports uh, going into uh, World War II in 1939. And by 1944, you had these competing plans, uh, John Maynard Keynes and Harry De- uh, for the U.K. and Harry Dexter White for the U.S. Treasury and, the, and, and White's plan. I was actually a communist spy. Uh, so fronting for the Soviet Union a little bit, but his plan prevailed. And that was the end of Sterling. And from then on, we were on a dollar gold standard under Bretton Woods. My point is the dollar surely replaced Sterling as the global reserve currency, but it took 30 years. I don't think this new um, transition is going to take 30 years. It might not take 30 months, but, but it's not going to happen overnight instantaneously. It's a process. So you have to watch the process. You have to watch the individual acts play out. And I'm seeing them everywhere. Um, Russia has tripled its gold reserves in the last 10 years. Why would you triple your gold reserves if gold is not a monetary asset, doesn't have a large a role to play in the future? China has tripled its gold reserves officially, I would say unofficially, probably more than quadrupled its gold reserves in the last 10 years. Again, same question. Are the Chinese stupid or do they see something that most people don't? Well, they're definitely not stupid. I spent time in China. I know a lot of people there. They know what they're doing. So, so they clearly see uh, a future, in, you know, backed by gold, in which uh, gold is uh, once again a, a primary monetary asset. Now, the specific point you made, Dave, about this oil for yuan, so let's unpack that a little bit because it's not uh, – it is a big deal, but it's kind of three or four separate contracts that are strung together with straight-through processing to synthetically um, – come up with this but but what china's saying is hey we're the biggest oil importer in the world we buy more oil than anybody we don't have much oil and the biggest sellers of course are saudi arabia russia um and we would like you guys to sell to us in yuan we'll pay you yuan and russia's sitting there saying well what are we going to do with the yuan i mean there's no bond market to speak of there's no large investable pool of yuan assets they can buy. There's not that much they can actually do with the yuan. So China says, no problem. Take the yuan from us for oil, and we can convert the yuan to gold spot on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We'll have a special facility that this yuan that we owe you, we'll just take it and sell it uh, on the on the Shanghai Gold Exchange and get gold, and now you own the gold. Um, but then people say, yeah, but we're not on a gold standard. I mean, gold, the price fluctuates in euros, and Yen and dollars, it's volatile, it's up and down. I don't like all that risk. And China says, no problem. We've got the Shanghai Gold Futures Exchange, and you can sell your gold forward on the futures exchange and hedge your price exposure. So you take three separate contracts. 
the oil purchase contract, the selling yuan spot on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and then hedging the gold forward on the Shanghai Gold Futures Exchange or Shanghai Futures Exchange. Together, it gets an oil seller where they want to be, which is they can get hard currency or they can get gold or they can hedge their exposure. They don't have to get you know up to their eyeballs in yuan. And yet, at the same time, China gets what it wants, which is a yuan benchmark price for oil, eventually leading to the end of the petrodollar. Now, the petrodollar deal was something that was cooked up by uh, Henry Kissinger and William Simon, Jerry Parsky, Helmut Sonnefeld, and some others in um, in the White House and the Treasury in 1974. Um, Helmut Sonnefeld was Kissinger's deputy. Kissinger was National Security Advisor at the time. Sonnefeld was Deputy National Security Advisor. His nickname was uh, Kissinger's Kissinger. He was the big brain behind Kissinger. Kissinger's a pretty big brain. Um, I actually met with uh, Helmut Sonnefeld and some others in the White House in 1974, and we were discussing a plan to invade Saudi Arabia and basically secure the oil, take over the oil fields, put up a security perimeter, and sell the oil at prices that we dictated to keep the price of oil low to help the U.S. economy. We wouldn't actually steal the oil or the money. We would just dictate the price and then put the money in trust for the Saudis, and that was the plan. Fortunately, that plan uh, was not followed through. That was not uh, that was not the plan that was implemented, although the, the purpose in, in devising that plan was to hold a gun to the head of the Saudis. It was sort of a good cop, bad cop, or a you know, carrot and stick approach. Um, you know, as Kissinger was saying implicitly, we want you, the Saudis, and OPEC to price oil in dollars. Um, but if you don't, we have a plan possibly to invade the uh, Saudi oil fields. And that was leaked, and it was in the newspapers and all that. And it was a threat to say, you know, do it our way, or, or well, you, know, you can do it the easy way, or you can do it the hard way, and the easy way is going to be a lot better for you. So the Saudis agreed to that. And then how the petrodollar deal actually worked is they sold us oil. We paid for it in dollars. They then took the dollars that we gave them and deposited those dollars in U.S. banks, such as Citibank, where I later worked uh, from um, not long after the episode I described until the mid-'80s. Um, I, I was international counsel at Citibank. Um, so they put the money in Citibank. Citibank would then lend it to you know Argentina or Chile or Mexico or wherever. Those countries could then use it to buy equipment and goods from the United States, which gave us our dollars back, which we could then use to buy the oil. So the whole thing went in a big circle, dollars for oil, oil back to dollars into the banks, lending to third world countries who bought our manufactured goods, and then we took the profits and bought more oil. Um, and it worked brilliantly. And, and by the way, uh, when if oil is priced in dollars and everybody needs oil, that meant everybody needs dollars because you need the dollars to buy the oil. And that put a floor under the dollar and propped it up. And, um, you know, that had, that hit a lot of rough patches in the, you know, there was a major comp- crisis of confidence in the dollar in the late 70s. Uh, but the petrodollar deal hung together and it's hung together all these years. But now we're seeing cracks in the wall. Now we're seeing the end of the petrodollar deal. So I would say both vectors, uh, the massive acquisitions of gold by Russia and China, clearly signaling uh, that they want to break out of dollar hegemony, go back to some kind of maybe a modified gold standard. We see the pricing of oil in yuan to try to create a yuan benchmark price for oil to um, to uh, diminish the importance of dollar pricing in oil, make the dollar just another currency. And then into the mix, let's throw distributed ledger technology, which is the more up-to-date technical name for blockchain, and uh, digital cryptocurrencies. Now, Christine Lagarde gave a very interesting speech this week where she talked about this. And, you know, the Bitcoin groupies are all like, oh, you know, IMF wants to buy Bitcoin. Well, no, that's not what she said. What she said was that they're very interested in the technology and distributed ledger technology. I expect, and by the way, the dollar and the IMF has their own kind of world money called the SDR, the special drawing right, the euro, the yen. All of these currencies are digital cryptocurrencies. I mean, the vast majority of all the transactions are digital. You don't, I mean, you, you and I, we don't get paid in, uh, with, with, um, when I was a little kid, they'd give you a pay envelope at the end of the week with, you know, however many uh, $20 bills stuck in it. It's not how you get paid today. You get a direct wire or direct deposit to your bank account. You pay for things with your credit card or your debit card. You know, people used to be embarrassed to use a credit card for a cup of coffee. Now it's like, hey, who cares? Two bucks, swipe my credit card. Doom, done. So, um, so all of our money is digital today. 
you might have a few bucks in your wallet, but not many relative to the amount of financial transactions you do. All that message traffic is encrypted. I mean, they're not, they're not sending that stuff over the internet with your name and address on it without using encryption. So dollars and euros and yen are digital cryptocurrencies now. What they don't have is distributed ledger technology. That is, the, the ledgers are centralized in banks or central banks or Fedwire or the Treasury or uh, European Central Bank or the Target 2 system, etc. All those ledgers are centralized. And what DLT, distributed ledger technology, allow, allows you to do is to you know, basically – using encryption to spread that information over, you know, hundreds of thousands of servers all over the world, completely decentralized. Now it's cheaper, could be faster, could be more robust. Uh, you're not depending on a certain bank. Uh, and yeah, maybe you recorded the servers, you blow up the server. Well, who cares? There are 10,000 other servers with the same, uh, you know, chain of information on it that can validate the transaction. So, um, and of course it's cashless and the global leads hate cash because, Cash can be used to uh, defeat negative interest rates, and uh, they suspect it's used to evade taxes. And, of course, the G20 governments are all going bankrupt in different ways, and so they need more tax collections. So they don't like uh, anything that enhances people's ability to evade taxes, etc. So for all these reasons, uh, governments and the IMF like distributed ledger technology. It gives them more power versus the banks. It gives them... Um, more power versus the people because you, you'll eliminate cash completely. Um, it, you know, disintermediates the banking system, as I mentioned. And so there's a lot of attractions there, but none of this has anything to do with Bitcoin. These are state cryptos, um, multilateral cryptos, IMF cryptos. That's what they're aiming for. And Jenna Yellen, uh, sorry, uh, Christine Lagarde more or less said that in her speech. She used the phrase dollarization 2.0. I took one look at that and said, no, you mean D dollarization 2.0 you just don't want to come out and say it um and so uh i would say that uh this uh acts as an accelerant in the rise of world money rise of uh, the sdr from the imf on top of everything else we talked about with russia and china and gold and and the, uh, the end of the petrodollar all of which is pointing in the same direction which is a ultimately um a diminution in the role of the dollar and the role of the dollar payment system in global financial transactions, combine that with a potential loss of confidence in the dollar engineered not by Russia, China, or the IMF, but by the Fed because of their bloated balance sheet, zero interest rate policy, uh, and their inability to normalize either one. Um, and, you know, it's a real uh, toxic mix for the dollar. Now, I just wanted to get this straight. What I'm hearing right now is that the central banking system is looking to take over maybe the crypto market and replace the dollar as the reserve currency with some type of uh, cryptocurrency. Well, they, they definitely want to replace the dollar with the SDR. That's been in the works since 1969. Um, but what's new is that uh, it's suddenly dawning on people at the IMF that the SDR can not just be a currency, but it can be um, uh, again, I, the word crypto, I don't really think applies. I would say it can be SDR can be traded and exchanged and used on uh, a distributed ledger, which is the so-called blockchain, and that uh, empowers it for use in global financial transactions without relying on the Fed or the Treasury or the dollar payment system. So it's just one more way to run run the dollar off the world, uh, or sorry, off the road. But um, I think I think cryptocurrencies have a future, but not you know Bitcoin and Ether. I mean, Ether has other uses in terms of so-called smart contracts apart from all these coins. But um, I don't think uh, Bitcoin has much of a future, but I do think the technology does, the, the technology platform, which will be made better in the future. But uh, the, the digital currencies of the future will be controlled uh, not by the web, but by governments. So if this does happen and the dollar ceases to exist in some form, what are the people here in the U.S. going to use then? Well, we'll still have dollars, but it'll be a local currency like Mexican pesos. Like if I go to Mexico on vacation, I'll you know buy some pesos either at the airport or at the hotel or someplace uh, for spending money. But otherwise, pesos aren't good for anything. I certainly can't use them in London. Uh, so we'll still have dollars. You know, you and I go out for a drink. I'll, I'll pay. Uh, You'll pay the bill in in dollars, but it'll be a local currency. It won't be the global reserve currency. Um, and that's a big deal because right now the U.S. doesn't worry about trade deficits or budget deficits or 
debt to GDP ratios or anything else that everyone else has to worry about because we just print dollars and the world accepts them. But what if that were not the case? What if the world said, you know, hey, U.S., I don't want dollars. I want SDRs. And oh, by the way, you don't have any. You can only get SDRs from the IMF. and They're not handing them out today. So in that world, all of a sudden, the IMF controls the global money supply. The SDR is the benchmark reserve currency. Maybe it's a gold-backed SDR, none of which has anything to do with the dollar. So I'm not saying the dollar is going to go away. I'm just saying people will lose confidence in it, and it will lose its status as the benchmark global reserve currency. So is everything being transferred to the central banking system where today we have the Fed, which is kind of intertwined with the government, but really not part of the government, where they're creating currency? Now, if that is taken away... Is that actually, is that process moving to China or is it moving to some other entity that has nothing to do with the country? Moving to the IMF, which is, uh, yeah, I was saying an entity that has nothing to do with the country. You know, I mean, the, 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 the Banco de Mexico, you know, the Central Bank of Mexico, they can print money. It's just that they print money that nobody else wants. Um, the Bank of Zimbabwe can print money, but they print money that nobody else wants. So you could get to a point where the Federal Reserve could still print money. Uh, still conduct open market operations, but would people have an appetite for dollars or would they be looking for other currencies? Now, by the way, the yuan and the ruble aren't any better. I mean, no one's going to want rubles. Uh, you know, it's an authoritarian regime. There's no rule of law. Same thing in China. It's, they're communists. You don't have a rule of law. So I'm not suggesting that the ruble or the, uh, the Chinese yuan or any other currency um, can defeat the dollar. I'm saying that that threat will come from the SDR, the special drawing right, which is printed by the IMF. Um, it's controlled by an executive committee. Now, by the way, the U.S. today has a big voice in the IMF. The U.S. has the largest single voice, and we have veto power. It takes uh, 80, an 85% vote to make significant changes or institute significant policies at the IMF, such as you know, a massive uh, money printing operation, SDRs. The United States has um, just over 16% of the vote. So since you need 85% to get things done, if you have 16% and we hold out, then you can't get to 85%. So the U.S. has an effective veto power. But beginning uh, next week um, and continuing its steps over the next year or so, there's a, a clear-cut movement that's been pre-announced to increase the uh, voting power of uh, China and the other BRICs. Um, and if you take the five BRICs together, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, uh, under this new plan, and they would, because right now they have about 14.9% uh, of the vote, just under 15%. But once they get any more votes at all, even a small amount, and they go over 15%, then acting together, they would also have a veto power. They'd have the same block of votes that the U.S. has. Um, so imagine a world where there's a financial panic going on and the central banks have not been able to normalize their balance sheet, as we talked about at the beginning of the interview. And you have to turn to the IMF for liquidity and print trillions of SDRs to bail out the system. And that requires a vote. And the BRICS are sitting there saying, huh, you want our votes? Well, here's what we want. In other words, they can lay down demands that work to the detriment of the dollar in exchange for not exercising their veto power to print SDRs and bail out the developed economies. That's a very powerful place to be, and that's where we're heading. Now, I wanted to switch gears here, and I just wanted to talk about North Korea. And you wrote a couple of articles about North Korea. One, why are we so concerned with North Korea? I mean, we're across the ocean. China and Russia, they border right up against North Korea. But it seems like the United States is very concerned with North Korea and about their nuclear technology, their missile technology. Why are we so concerned about what they are doing? Because they're very close to the point where they can fire a nuclear-armed ICBM and kill a million people in Seattle. So, I mean, in reality, do you really think that they would go that far? Why not? Uh, they have some unfinished business in South Korea. Um, you know, the conventional theory of deterrence is that um, they would never do that because we would nuke them. Uh, really? Um, I mean, look, these are people who were, uh, first of all, the leadership doesn't care about the people. They don't care if a couple million North Koreans get killed. They had a famine in the 1990s. People were eating bark off of trees. The leadership have bomb-proof compounds that are fully stocked. They can go to for an indefinite period of time. So if they detected U.S. missiles heading their way, they would just go into their bunkers, let the whole place get blown up, you know, wait a couple months, come out, wave the flag, and, you know, pronounce uh, 
socialism. In other words, they're, they're, they're not deterrable the way the Russians were, the way um, the Chinese were. The, the conventional theory of deterrence doesn't work on them, number one. Number two, um, they don't actually have to blow up Seattle. They just have to have that capability, which then acts as a credible threat to allow them to do other things. For example, they could invade South Korea. And so then South Korea says, hey, America, come help us, you know, the way you did in 1950. Uh, and the U.S. says, here we come. And North Korea says, don't you dare. If you guys go into South Korea, I'm going to fire the missile at Seattle or San Diego. Uh, now you're president of the United States. Do you want to trade Seoul for Seattle? Uh, do you want to trade uh, Pusan for Portland? Uh, probably not. Uh, that makes the U.S. nuclear umbrella less credible drives a wedge between the U.S. and its allies in South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and elsewhere. Japan probably would have nuclear weapons in a matter of months. They're capable of that. Um, and you know, completely destabilize East Asia and drive the U.S. out of the Western Pacific. Um, is that a good outcome? So th this is the way the United States is thinking about it. This is why we regard it as an existential threat. And this is why we're going to war with North Korea probably in the next six to eight months to stop North Korea from getting this capability in the first place. So you think we're we're definitely going to war? I mean, you you think troops on the ground, or you think just a war from the air? Because is, is China and Russia just going to sit back and watch this? Uh, yeah, uh, a couple things. Uh, first of all, all of the above will have uh, um, this. This will not be aimed at just um, uh, reducing their nuclear weapons capability. This will be regime change. This will be the end of Kim Jong Un. So you're talking about. Um, it'll start out with um, cyber operations. The place will go dark, shut down the power grid, shut down communication, shut down the Internet. Not that they have a lot, but whatever they have, they'll do. We use psychological operations uh, to create um, you know, rumors of uh, a coup d'etat underway. Um, Special Operations Command will go in to you know, specifically target the leadership and some of these facilities. Then we'll use massive strategic bombing to disable the artillery barrage that will be aimed at South Korea. And then probably some troops on the ground. Uh, just to you know, secure um, secure the capital and make sure the regime chain is is effective. Plus, a secret weapon. You know, I, I launched in Washington last week with a top national security advisor to the Chinese Politburo, and I I started discussing secret weapons. And first, she laughed. You know, but it was that kind of nervous laughter that people use when they actually don't like the topic. Um, and then she got a little more sober, and then she um, said, "Yeah." Uh, actually, Ash Carter had said the same thing to her. Ash Carter is a former Secretary of Defense. So, um, you know, when you say secret weapon, people kind of roll their eyes. But uh, the atomic bomb was a secret weapon until we dropped it. And even after we dropped it, the, we had to do it again because the Japanese still didn't believe it. So my point is, um, do you really think that DARPA and the Defense Department and Raytheon and Los Alamos National Laboratory have been sitting around twiddling their thumbs for the last 10 years? No. They, they've got weapons that we don't know about specifically there there there's a thing called a kind of a non-nuke nuke it's a um, it uses a nuclear technology um to create a subcritical reaction that releases enormous energy without the radiation so it's it's kind of a sort of nuclear weapon but not exactly um uh, but it would be massively more powerful than um the bombs we have today and that could be used to suppress this north korean artillery attack so um i, I say combination of all the you know, cyber, psychological, uh, kinetic, uh, special operations and other, you know, naval, et cetera, uh, salience I mentioned, I would throw in some kind of secret weapon that would reduce casualties in South Korea and maybe make this whole thing feasible from the U.S. perspective. Now, is China and Russia, are they on board with this or are they just going to sit and watch? Well, if you're Russia, you'd love to see the United States waste another trillion dollars, kill a bunch of Americans, kill a bunch of South Koreans. I mean, it would just, this would be horrendous for the United States and for South Korea. So if Russia, you know, you just, it's like, like being a, a, a spectator, you know, watch the gladiators kill each other and you just sit there and, you know, pass the popcorn. Uh, so Russia has a lot to gain from it in terms of relative power. And that's the way Putin thinks about things. It's not, it, this is the, you know, I did a financial war game for the Pentagon in 2009, and the way we thought about things was not absolute power, but relative power. Could you end up with more power than you started relative to the other guy, even if everybody lost a little? Um, but so Russia has the most to gain just by being on the sidelines. Now, China, I agree, uh, this, uh, seems to threaten a number of their interests, but the U.S. would, uh, talk to China in advance and assure them that their interests would be looked out for. Now, that's delicate because, you know, we don't even trust the South Koreans not to tell the North Koreans. So you don't want to tell 
China too early what you're doing because they could tell the North Koreans and help them prepare, et cetera. Having said that, you do have to tell them specifically at some point, not like generally, the, the war, you know, the, the tempo and the, what the French call les logiques de guerre or the logic of war. That's already playing out. You know, in, um, you know, the United States invaded Iraq in March 2003. It's not like they woke up the day before and say, oh, gee, let's invade Iraq. Those orders were given a year before. I mean, General Mattis, who was commandant, uh, commander of the uh, uh, 1st Marine Division, he got his war orders in 2002. They knew it was coming. Well, as I said, those orders have already been given. The U.S. military is not going to do this overnight. They're getting ready for the war right now. Uh, and that signaling is, is out there. The markets are oblivious. The markets seem to be sleepwalking through it. Most, I think a lot of com- the commentators are kind of mushy. They think this deterrence works, which it doesn't for the reason I mentioned. But the point being, um, we're, we're clearly, the, the signals are there. We're clearly heading in that direction, but we'll, we'll bring the Chinese into the fold late in the game. Uh, by the way, if your listeners want to see a very specific signal, something that when it happens, We'll tell you the war is maybe only a couple of weeks away. Right now, I would say we may still be six months away. But to know you're within a couple of weeks is when you evacuate American civilians from South Korea. So one day, the State Department will issue an order. You know, we we order a request or strongly urge all Americans to leave South Korea. There are seventy thousand American civilians in South Korea. I'm not counting the military personnel. They'll have to stay and fight. But uh, when you see a, the civilian evacuation, you'll know the war is just a couple of weeks away. But um, China, what does China care about? They, they don't want reunification on our terms, meaning putting South Korea in charge, that we would give them some assurance that they would be partners in reunification or, or reconstitution of a North Korean regime on terms acceptable to them. We'd give them that assurance. We'd tell them that we're not going to go anywhere near the Yalu River, which is the border between North Korea and China. So, you know, you don't have to worry about a replay of 19, 19- 51 when, uh, you know, 52 when Douglas MacArthur was uh, ready to invade China and basically give them all the assurances they need with respect to their interests, uh, but tell them we're going to go ahead anyway because of our interests. James Rickards, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see all your work? Well, thank you, Webb. Uh, my website, jamesrickardsproject.com. Uh, I've also started a, a new company using artificial intelligence and uh, teamed up with IBM to uh, do the predictive analytics I talked about on this program. That's called Miraglim, M-E-R-A-G-L-I-M.com. So have a look at uh, Miraglim.com. and also very active on Twitter at James G. Rickards. And my book's uh, most recent one, The Road to Ruin. James, thank you very much again for being on the Spotlight. I really appreciate it. 